Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in History. This is uh, Marcus Grodi, your co-host for this program, joined by Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. Hello, Monsignor Steenson. A good afternoon to you. Hello. Blessings to you. Good to be with you, Monsignor. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoy the study we're doing. I hope those of you listening have enjoyed it. Um, and it, something struck me, even as I was just thinking here as we begin this uh, continuing study of Against Heresies, is it, it kind of struck me funny. It reminded me of, uh, I'm not a big student of the Doctor Who series on TVs. I haven't watched, I've got friends have watched every single episode six times, but I, I, I've only oh. seen a few of them. But it reminded me of the first episode, the first early episodes where, and if you've watched Doctor Who, in the oldest episodes, the the two teachers walk into this room and, and there's a, there's a police booth, like an old phone booth. It's just a little booth. And when they open the door and they walk in, it's a huge room. You know, again, like it's a bit like yeah. like going through the wardrobe in in C.S. Lewis's yeah. uh, Narnia tales, and you walk through this little door and it's a, a kingdom. It's, it's huge, yeah. And that's what I'm finding in our study, Monsignor, is that by looking at it little by little, it's really opening up the window to so many things that that we didn't think about talking about or that we didn't often think about. And to me, that's the beauty yeah. of digging into these early church fathers. Gives us a glimpse into the early part of the church that we take for granted and maybe we, we read through something we don't think much of it, but if we pause and we reflect on it, it opens a window to a, a bigger part of our faith. Now, what we're going to do today, those of you who are following us in this Keeble translation of Against Heresies, we're on page 208, we're in book three, and we're in chapter three. Last week, we were focused on on the earliest bishops of Rome. This week, the title of our episode is Polycarp and the Old Tradition Apostolic. Because we encounter uh, a, a person who was extremely important in the life of Irenaeus. Isn't that true, Monsignor? That's right, yeah. Irenaeus basically got his MDiv degree from Polycarp. <laughs> <laughs> he was his he was his mentor in the faith. Yeah, I don't know if I can't remember. I've read so much in background to this now, but you know, Irenaeus, we believe, was converted to the faith through Polycarp, who was converted to the faith by John, who was converted to the faith by Jesus. That's how close we are. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just, it's awesome, awe-inspiring just to think about how close we are right now. And yeah. the reason to me it's important is if you, if you want to compare this, for example, I think we mentioned this last week to the, in the Old Testament when Joshua, who had received the law from Moses— who had received the law from God, and then Joshua passes it on to the people and says, okay, people, are you going to obey it? And they say, we will obey it. And you, when you read in the book of Joshua, and then when you read in the book of Judges, it tells us that the people remained faithful as long as the people who were around who knew Joshua. Yeah. But once those people died, then the people went off on their own. Well, we're at a time when we're, we're reading the writing of someone who knew someone who knew someone who was with Jesus. And there are people still around. They weren't alive during the time of Christ. This is 175. But there are people who are around who Polycarp was around, who yeah. knew John. And Irenaeus, I can't remember if Irenaeus knew John or not. I can't remember that right now. I don't know that he was... No, I don't think so. Yeah, so he... I don't, he yeah, I don't think he did. So. Okay, all right. So anyway, yeah. 
So we have Irenaeus and Polycarp. So this is about Polycarp. And uh, so I just finished 10 minutes ago an hour-long episode with my son John Mark doing a Deep in Scripture episode on the fear of God. So what I'm going to do in our program, Monsignor, is I think I'm going to read and then let you do all the intelligent stuff. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you're going to do better. But. <laughs> I just, because, yeah. uh, and I hope those of you who are listening to this will listen to our Deep in Scripture episode that John Mark and I did on Cyprian and uh, some questions on the, on the fear of God. So let me begin in section four. Uh, he, uh, Irenaeus has just turned from describing the list of the bishops of Rome, and then he says, and Polycarp too who had not only been trained by the apostles and had conversed with many of those who had seen Christ, but also had been constituted by the apostles bishop over Asia in the church of Smyrna, whom we also saw in the first age of our life. So let's pause there. I mean, right there is the summary of, of the connection that Irenaeus has. And um, I w it struck me that how Irenaeus um, says that he had been constituted um, bishop over Asia. So we're not just dealing with a small town bishop here. He had responsibility for these other churches in, and this is the province of Asia, um, which would be, you know, Today, it would be a great part of um, Western Turkey hmm. uh, where that is. And so he had a very significant experience, um, responsibility here. So essentially, we have a bishop of the West, Irenaeus, writing uh -huh. about a bishop of the East. So we see the full church represented between Irenaeus and Polycarp. And the connectivity, because it was the bishop of the East, Polycarp, that converted Irenaeus. Yeah. And then, of course, Irenaeus ends up in Lyon and then ends up... Was, was I can't remember now. Was Irenaeus in Lyon during that persecution? Uh, no. He had been sent by the bishop in Lyon to Rome um, uh, to do... Uh, what was he doing? He was... Um, that was the Marcion visit, I think. Mm. Or was that, the, yeah, that was the, yeah. So um, so he was dealing with those kind of questions in Rome when the persecution happened and when he got back, there was virtually no one left in the in leadership in the church there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he goes on to say, uh, for he, meaning Polycarp, tarried with us long in, in extreme old age, by a glorious and distinguished martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught those things which he learned from the apostles, which the church delivers, which alone are true. So now we have reference to the, the famous um, document that survives from the early days of the church, and that's the martyrdom of of Polycarp. Uh, of Polycarp, that's right. Probably the really the first vivid um, martyrology, or you know, martyrology. I guess you say we have. Um, and I, I, I just may I just read a little bit from the, the martyrdom of Polycarp. Please. That that moment when, you know, he was hiding out on a farm, just sort of outside. It's, Outside of Zanesville, basically. Yeah, he does it like I do every every day. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and they came after him, and brought him in. And he was in the uh, in a trial. The proconsul sought to persuade him to deny Christ. Have you have respect to your old age? Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, away with the atheists, because Christians were considered atheists because they denied the existence of the Roman gods. Polycarp gazing with a stern countenance on all the multitude of the wicked heathen in the stadium, 
and waving his hands toward them, while with groans he looked up to heaven and said, away with the atheists. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, he finishes in the, in the cross-examination. He, he would not do what the um, proconsul wanted him to do, which is to renounce Christ. And he said, 80 and six years have I served him and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Which those words um, enchanted the early Christians. Um, this was this is a very very precious text for these early generations yeah. of Christians. They took a lot of comfort from this encouragement. Yeah, the the devil tried to destroy the early church in the same way that he had destroyed Israel in the end of the Old Testament. He, they began by, he began by trying to con convince the Christians to surrender to paganism, and they would not, right? They would not. They would That's not. right. They would not. When you read First and Second Kings, you read with the fall of Israel and Judah, they surrendered to paganism, idols. The, here was the call to Polycarp was the model of that. And then when that didn't work, then the devil turned to, well, let's get these Christians caught up in these Greek stuff. Yeah. So there was Gnosticism. And at the front of the fight against Gnosticism is Irenaeus and the other early philo Christian philosophers that, that fought against Gnosticism, put it down. And then, of course, the next thing the devil tried to do, well, if they won't give in to there, well, then I'm just going to kill them so that you have martyrdom and persecution and because certainly they'll they'll back away from that and uh, the, and we have the, the hundreds of people that faithfully died so yeah and it's you know Marcus it's it's um, maybe a cautionary note for us today because we're we live in a time where we're asked to make peace with all sorts of things that are contrary to the Christian vocation. And um, it's not hard to imagine that any of us could be in the same position that Polycarp found himself in. I, I would venture to say, as I wrote in my book, is that to a certain extent, most of us are blind to the ways we've already compromised. Yeah, to our good call. point. You know, a very be, good point. Paul said, be ye not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, in Romans 12. Well, to what extent have we conformed? And, you know, I, I mentioned that the devil tried to stop everything with paganism and it didn't work, tried to stop everything with Gnosticism, it didn't work, tried to stop everything with persecution and Martin didn't work. But what did work? Well, the Milan Bridge or whatever it's called, you know, the the freedom of Christianity. All of a sudden, in the fourth century under Constantine, we had laxity and freedom, mm -hmm. no more persecution. And pretty soon, then the spiritual writers have always said in the history of the church that when things become lax, our faith becomes lax. That's right. That's right. And it, it wasn't just an older thing because we see in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when, when our Lord is speaking through John to the seven churches, he says, you're lukewarm. I'd rather you were hot or cold, but I'll spew you out of your mouth. Well, yeah, that was a, a, a forerunner of what happened in some ways, not in the, in the, yeah. in the fourth century. So anyway, but here we back are in the, in the, the end of the second century and Irenaeus goes on. Oh, I want to also point out, having always taught those things which you learned from the apostles, which the church delivered, which all alone are true. That's the apostolic succession. Right? That's the core of it. That's, that is the core of it. The Lord to the apostles yeah. passed down, the church delivers, which alone are true. The apostolic succession. He goes on, these things are witnessed by all the churches in Asia and by those who down to our time have succeeded Polycarp. 
a far more credible and sure witness to the truth than Valentinus and Marcion, and the rest with their bad opinions. And he, sojourning in Rome under Anesitus, converted to God's church many of the forementioned heretics, proclaiming himself to have received from the apostles that one and only truth which hath been handed on by the church. And there are some who have been told by him how that John, the Lord's disciple in Ephesus, going to bathe and seeing Serinthus in the place, leaped out of the bath without using it, adding, let us fly, lest the very bath fall on us, where Serinthus, the enemy of the truth, is. And Polycarp to himself, when Marcion came into his sight and said, Knowest thou me? replied, I know the firstborn of Satan. Such pious care had the apostles and their disciples not to communicate so much as by word with any of those who put a false stamp on the truth. As Paul also said, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that such an one is perverted and sinneth, being self-condemned. So we'll pause there, Monsignor. There's a lot of stuff in that paragraph. A lot of stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the first thing maybe to comment on is um, is Polycarp being in Rome under um, under how you pronounce it and Anicetus, right? It's uh, I'm, Anicetus, and I'm sure yeah. if that's the way I pronounce I it, it's probably wrong. I, I just I remember always hearing Anicetus, okay. but it's you know. Right. But actually, technically, I would guess if we're following good Latin rules, your pronunciation is better. With my However, many my many years of Latin uh, yeah. work, uh, so <laughs> and, and, and of course I was corrupted by the English, you know. So um, <laughs> no, but what is interesting about that is um, Pope uh, Anicetus or Anesitus was um, Bishop of Rome, probably from the mid. 150s um, for about to I think 168 was his death. So during somewhere during that time, Polycarp came to Rome. Um, he didn't come. His purpose in going to Rome was not initially anyway to deal with the Gnostics. He went to argue for um, a, a more tolerant approach to the different ways Christians determine the date of Easter. Oh yes. So, because he comes from that tradition um, in Asia Minor, where uh, they celebrated Easter on the actual day of of um, the Passover, and so that's what he was doing in Rome initially. But um, it's interesting how how he engaged so quickly with these people that he would have seen in Ephesus um, um, and in and in Smyrna. Um, so he knew them, yeah. and there they were trying to, you know, start a new church in Rome, and and he he engaged them. In fact, in, in over on page two ten, when we get to it, we're going to talk more about that. Uh, the rise of these groups in Rome. We'll we'll get to that in a moment. But again, also here we see the continuation of the apostolic faith. We have from Christ to the apostles which the church delivers, which alone is true. And then these things were witnessed by all the churches in Asia. So you have mm -hmm. the apostolic going to the churches, so all those churches can trace their roots to an apostolic church. And then by those who down to our time have succeeded Polycarp, the bishops in those churches that have yeah. their apostolic orders from the apostles. And, and that kind of reminds us of what Keeble himself in his footnote was arguing back there. In other words, so in this passage, we have the apostolic succession in the East. That's right. It's essentially what we see here in the East of the church, where Keeble was trying to make the distinction that in Rome, in the previous, we were seeing the, the apostolic succession in the West. Because his argument was that all the churches that are in the western part of the church had had their roots through Rome because that was Peter and, and Paul. So that's why they all agreed with, with Rome. 
Uh, right. Keeble was trying to make the distinction that, that that's different in the a, in the East, but Irenaeus isn't making that distinction. Of course, yeah. When um, when John Keeble was writing, he was trying to make the argument that they were so beloved with the Anglicans that they were um, they were an authentically Catholic church, and that the Catholic Church is a federation of, of patriarchal churches, if you will. Yeah. Um, and um, so, it, you know, they, he certainly wouldn't have accepted the, the primacy of the Bishop of Rome over all the churches. Another very well-known part of this section is the part about John, um, you know, escaping from the bath because yeah. he saw Serinthus there. And also Polycarp himself when he encounters Marcion, you know, backs yeah. away, calls him the firstborn of Satan. And, I mean, this is the story. I remember this way back when I was a Protestant minister. I remember this because when you run into the, the Serenthus and, and, and other writings. But what jumps out of, about this, what it reminds me of Monsignor, is in the earlier days of the church, There was a, a a stronger emphasis on shunning. It was, yeah, the fellowship of Christ's body should remain pure, um, and this would be to bring in um, corrupted elements. You know, yeah, there was a, to tolerate that. You know, there was a big struggle uh, between. On the one hand, you have the parable of Christ where you have the weed and the tares and, you know, the weeds and the, and the good crop grow up together and we don't try and pick the weeds out now. We'll wait to the end and, and let the Lord do that. So there's that argument that, you know, that argument in the church includes everybody. And then, but then you have the other based on the church consists of, of, of those that are true believers. And both sides have scriptural foundation. So that that caused problems in the early church. I mean, even Tertullian got caught up in that. Isn't that true? I mean, he got drawn into a group. Yeah, yeah, he did. A Montanist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he set himself over against the Catholic Church. And I think the Donatists were a bit of that, weren't they? Yeah, I, I think. they were too. Uh -huh. But what we see here, if we ask, okay, which side of the divide does Irenaeus fall? Well, he finds he falls on the side of shunning. Absolutely, yeah. Such pious care had the apostles and their disciples not to communicate so much as by word with any of those who put a false stamp on the truth. And you know what this reminds me of? After the Reformation, and you have Luther's the division and the mm -hmm. Calvinist division. There was another group that divided away, and they were the group called the Anabaptists. And their concern, they, their main issue was they didn't see anything in the Bible that justified infant baptism. So they believed in adult baptism. And so they believed anybody that had been baptized as a child needed to be rebaptized. And so that's how they that movement got started. And, and the truth is that links to some historical examples in the early church too, around the time of Cyprian. That's right. There's a big battle about if somebody fell away, yeah. didn't, you know, uh, lapsed during the martyrdoms of the end of the second century, mid third century, if they lapsed and then came back, did they have to be rebaptized? Or if they left the church and then were baptized in some uh, breakaway group right. and came back to the Catholic church, did they have to be baptized? That was a big issue in the early church. And that's where, you know, the tradition we have that if baptism is done with water, with the valid formula, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's valid, 
even if it's done by a layman and actually even if it's done by a non-believer um uh but but basically that tradition you know was rooted in that controversy in in the middle of the third century middle of the third century yeah. i was reading yeah. in densinger once densinger is a, a really interesting book of collections of the writings of throughout the history of the church and sometime in the i think the 1500s the pope had to tell a group up in norway that they couldn't use beer to baptize. It wasn't a valid baptism. It's in the official teachings of the church. So, I mean, all that's, it's, it's yeah. in the rubrics, you know, it's, yeah. it's there. But the reason I point this out is that, so you have the Anabaptists, which took very seriously the scriptures, yeah. especially on simplicity and detachment and on not communicating with those outside the church. And, and so you have the Mennonites following a, a priest, Menno Simons, and who breaks away and gets married, and, and then you have the Anabaptists. Well, over time, apparently they were becoming a bit lax on their shunning, and it was causing a controversy. They were, they were be, being friends with non-Anabaptists. And so one particular Anabaptist stood up and a group broke away with the insistence on shunning. And his name was, last name was Ammon. And that's where we get the Ammonites, the Amish, the Amish, based on this idea. So that's why they're a much more isolated group, much more conservative. Although I, and I, my wife and I just took a couple of days for our anniversary and went up into the Amish country, which is just an hour away from us. And the sad, the interesting thing is, uh, they don't shun as much as they used to. They, yeah. they too, have have opened because it's a struggle. How do you balance this? This very issue, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that such a one is perverted and sinneth, being self-condemned. How do you keep the balance with love as well as truth? And to this day, it's a struggle. Right. It's a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll get to see it when we get into the next section. I wanted to give you a little example of that. Yeah. Even... Even um, Irenaeus was, or Polycarp was dealing with this issue. That's right. So let's in, we would go on, and there is also yeah. an epistle of Polycarp written to the Philippians, a very powerful one, from which both the stamp of his faith and his preaching of the truth may be learned by those who will and who are careful of their own salvation. And that that epistle to the Philippians. Um, by the way, that also is one of your publications on the, uh, in the Coming Home Network catalog. Um, yep. That's in... Uh, Dr. Hans. I mean, Dr. Kenneth Howell. Yeah, Dr. Howell's book on the Apostolic Fathers. It's an amazing text. And what... I know you were going to say something about it. The one that jumped out at me was um, in paragraph 11 of... Um, or section 11 of his letter to the Philippians. And one of the things that occasioned this letter from Polycarp was their, their pastor basically went belly up. Hmm. Um, I am exceedingly sorry for balance once you're presbyter because he so little appreciates the office conferred on him I admonish you, therefore, shun avarice and be pure and honest. Well, apparently what happened was that Pastor Balance and his wife um, seem to have gotten their hands caught in the cookie jar of the parish finances. <laughs> um, and, and this is one of the things that occasioned uh, his letter. And so he's saying... You know, um, in this section, he goes on to say, um, you know, we all need to be 
learn from this example. Um, avarice, love of money, leads us into all sorts of problems. And he says it it takes us into idolatry in this section. You know, I wonder if it's possible that Valens, um, after he got kicked out of the church in, in uh, Philippi, joined one of those Gnostic groups, who, know, who knows? But what Marcus, what he said later on in that paragraph 11 there is, I am exceedingly sorry for that man and his wife. May the Lord grant them sincere repentance. And you too, therefore, must be considerate in this matter. Do not treat such persons as enemies, but reclaim them as diseased and strang members so that you may preserve the whole of your community intact. So that I think that's the other side of this um, uh, of, of, of the coin, if you will, keeping a proper balance between separation and, and compassion. And it's, I, I, it just jumped out at me as something very powerful. Well, it's so interesting, I think, that you pointed out that warning against avarice, covetousness, be chaste and truthful. My view of... of the New Testament is, I see it parallel as a, if you will, an antitype or a type based on the Old Testament when you have mm -hmm. uh, Moses giving the law to the people or Joshua giving the law to the people. And in the New Testament, we have our Savior giving the new law to the people. Mm -hmm. And our Lord prays that they stay united, not like Israel did. And he lays out the, the rules and how they are to, to follow him. And he lays out the, the two ways, if you will, as we see in the, in the Didache. Here's the way you're supposed to do it. This is the way of light. And then there's the, the way of darkness. You don't want to do that. And we see that. And then the New Testament epistles are all, don't do this. Stay tight. Stay faithful. Be careful. And, But when you look in Irenaeus, it's still part of that time period of saying, don't do this. And what we see, sadly, as we get into, I think, the 3rd and the 4th, then the 5th century, is that many of them don't heed the warnings. Yeah. Just like the people after Joshua didn't heed the warnings, the people after Moses didn't heed the warnings, you know, the people after David didn't heed the Solomon didn't heed the warnings. And so we have the divisions. Well, we the people, and so sadly, the people didn't heed the warnings of Irenaeus to abstain from avarice, covetousness, mm -hmm. be chaste, be truthful. I mean, you get into the details of the history and, you know, when, when times got easy and lax. Um, now, the, the, the section of, because there's so much we could cover in that too, but because of time we won't. Yeah. Um, I want to look at chapter two of the epistle to Polycarp. And the reason I bring this out is as a former Presbyterian pastor, former Calvinist, brought up Lutheran, there's always this real strong emphasis that we're saved by faith alone, mm -hmm. not works. You know, it's real strong emphasis to almost feel like you got a bad taste in your mouth whenever you emphasize the, the call to do something good for the Lord. You know, that's a that's a work. You know, and and there's a real emphasis on that. And but what gets me is when you go back to the early church fathers, and then you see the trajectory of the teaching of Christ through the book of Revelation, all the New Testament says we will one day be held accountable on how we lived. We'll be held accountable before God on what we do. There's no argument there about, well, was it God doing it through you, or were you freely doing it? I mean, it wasn't a Pelagian issue. That wasn't the issue, and who did it? That's not the point. The point is you got to do it. You got to live faithfully, regardless of where it came mm -hmm. from, grace or you. It's so, and the reason I emphasize that is when we go back to these early writings, what does he say? He says, 
<clears throat> but he who raised him up from the dead will raise up us also if we do his will and walk in his commandments and love what he loved, keeping ourselves from all unrighteousness, covetousness, love of money, evil speaking, false witness, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing or blow for blow or cursing for cursing, but being mindful of what the Lord said in his teaching, judge not that ye not be judged, forgiven it shall be forgiven you, be merciful that ye may obtain mercy, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And once more, blessed are the poor and those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Polycarp is just taking the teaching of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. and saying it still applies, and we're called to live it in obedience to Christ. I love the way you put it. You know, it's a continuity. Yeah. Or as yeah. as as uh, as uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth would say, a hermeneutic of continuity. It's recognizing that the continued teaching. All right, um, where are we at here? Oh, we're at still the bottom of uh, page two oh. two eight. So yeah, uh -huh. at a snail's pace. He goes on, yea, and the church in Ephesus, having had both Paul for its founder and John to abide among them until the times of Trajan, is a true witness of the apostolic tradition. Now, this one simple sentence is an important sentence, because I see it, if you will, as the other side of the coin, where on the other back a chapter or two, it was talking about Rome and the authority of Rome because it was the apostolic church of the West founded on Paul and Peter. And here we see Irenaeus emphasizing the church in Ephesus as the apostolic church in the East founded on Paul and John. Right? That's right. Um, and, you know, Marcus, there's a very important little um, uh, detail in that sentence that's worth pointing out, too, that um, Paul was the founder and John lived among them until the time of Trajan. And since we can put Trajan's imperial um, office at, at the years 98 to 117, this is the most important piece of historical evidence we have as to how long John actually tarried. Um, he was a very old guy. But, yeah. you know, Which is the, yeah. I mean, there's no concrete evidence that any of the Gospels were written later right. in the first century. We, we, you know, I mean, Matthew might yeah. have written it three years after the resurrection of Jesus. We don't know. But this is where we get the idea that the Gospel of John was much later. Yeah. Right? That's right. And, and I think that's a reasonable argument. Uh, or the, well, I think we find that in... I think we're going to find that actually in Irenaeus as we go forward when he talks about John. It's, you know, this is the, this is the spiritual Gospel. It, yeah. it, um, the fruit of a lot of reflection. Um, let me read, uh, we move into chapter four and then section one. Let me read that whole okay. section, Monsignor, and then reflect okay. on it. Because in a way, this paragraph kind of sums up, brings to a close everything he's just been talking about. Mm -hmm. this, this is bringing it all together. And here's what he writes. The proofs, therefore, being so abundant, we ought no more to look for the truth elsewhere which it is easy to obtain from the church, the apostles having therein most abundantly deposited as in a rich storehouse whatsoever appertains to the truth, so that whosoever will may take from her the drought of, the draft the, of life. The draft, yeah. For this is the entrance into life, 
but all the rest are thieves and robbers. Wherefore we ought, shunning them with all diligence to love what belongs to the church and to lay hold of the tradition of the truth. For why? Though the dispute were but of some ordinary question, would it not be meet to recur to the most ancient churches where the apostles went in and out, and from them to receive, on any present question, that which is certain and clear indeed? And what if not even the apostles themselves had left us any scriptures? Ought we not to follow the course of that tradition which they delivered to those whom they entrusted with the churches. I mean, wow. that, that is yeah. such a powerful ap apologetic defense on holding, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, stand firm on the tradition which you have received, whether it was in writing or oral. First, First Thessalonians two fifteen. There's a and second. I, you one. know, I, I know you're such a, a huge fan of the doctrine of development in John Henry Newman. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you did you catch the point? Ought we not to follow the course of that tradition? If there was, if it wasn't in Scripture, ought we not still to follow the course of the tradition, the way that um, that. Uh, a teaching has been developed in the life of the church um, because the apostles delivered to those whom they entrusted with the churches. So that it's, is that not well uh, a case for doctrinal development? If you go back to, yes, well, let me go back to chapter one of book three and read uh -huh. this again. For indeed the Lord of all gave to his apostles the power of the gospel and by them we have known the truth, i.e. the teaching of the Son of God. And then he says, For by no others have we known the method of our salvation than those by whom the gospel came to us, which was both in the first place preached by them and afterwards by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillow of our faith. So he describes there the passing on of this tradition from Jesus to the apostles and then to their successors. And some of that got written down, but the core of it. And he says, well, what if they hadn't written it down, is what he's saying. Because yeah. when he says scriptures here, he's not talking about the Old Testament. No. He's already talking. He's talking yeah. He's, so he's, he's talking about that, that which they heard from Jesus that they then put down, which we have as the Gospels. And as we've mentioned before, Irenaeus quotes every New Testament book except Jude and maybe Second Peter, I think, uh, and maybe James. I forget which he doesn't. But it doesn't mean he doesn't read. He just didn't use them for his argument. That's all it means. So my argument would be against those that want to, and, and you're not doing this, I mean, but that want to make Scripture and tradition two separate things. Right. And that's one thing he's not saying. There's one that's tradition. Right period, the apostolic tradition, um, the tradition of the truth, he calls it. In a moment, he'll call it the old tradition. And in the process, some of it was written down as gospels, but not as if, hey, we've got this stuff that Jesus taught us. We better put some of it down because there's going to be a couple of dummies in the 21st century up there that are going to be trying to talk about, so they better have it written down. No, it, it was in the process of ministry that every letter was written. It was occasional writings, not intentional theological documents. Right. And, um, and I, I, you know, I well, think it really does... I would love, I wish Martin Luther could join us on this point, you know, because how do you get sola scriptura out of this? Or at least the way that sola scriptura exercised by a private individual. Yeah, there, you know. Again, I look back in my days as a Protestant minister and I don't, 
I don't know what I would have, how I would have answered that because what, what I would have probably had to argue is that some point in the future, because the church had become so corrupt that the only thing yeah. that survived intact was what had been written down because the rest we could no longer be sure. And the truth is there's not a whole lot in this entire book of Irenaeus that is based on anything but what is in Scripture. He doesn't go very far beyond Scripture. No, I agree with that. That's a good point. You, you know, it, yeah. he doesn't, in fact, he says, let's don't go where God doesn't speak. So he's, he really says, he's, he's saying stick with Scripture. That's what he says. And he's not equating Scripture and tradition, but he's really hanging tight to Scripture. And on the other hand, and, and I don't, you know, I want to be, I, I don't necessarily see development referenced here. <laughs> because, in other words, what I see is more of what, well, who was it, Bousset, his view on, on the passing uh -huh. on. In other words, there was a deposit handed by Christ to his apostles, and that was handed on to the churches. And the way that you hold the truth is you're always going back to those churches that got that deposit. And at this point in time, he's just talking about that deposit. That's but, right. But something that's beyond that, that's developed into something new that couldn't really be found in that, he's not, that hasn't happened yet. But I, I would say that we at least have an opening here to that because... He's trying to give us some encouragement to be trusting of the apostolic tradition and that like we find ourselves in a faithful community and we can trust that faithful Catholic community. I'm talking about, you know, the in the historical sense of the word. Because look at what goes on in the in the second section. He when he talks about um those that are simple, that are... All right. Now, before we get into that, okay, okay. Let's, let's go there. Right. I do want okay. to point out, because when I look at it, I see two sides of this, and I can see two interpretations. That all has to do with the in, in, interpretation of the word course. That's what you're emphasizing in the end, um, in the end of section one. Right. Okay. In other words... Uh -huh. That And what if not even the apostles themselves had left us any scriptures, in other words, if they hadn't written something down, ought we not to follow the course of that tradition which they delivered to those whom they entrusted with the churches? So your way of understanding the word course includes the idea that this idea passed on is in the process of developing. Because it's, uh, yes, because it's a living tradition. Okay, but again, that's an interpret yeah. that's a hermeneutic. Fair enough. Because yeah, one could argue enough. that the word course is map following the map. It came from the upper room yeah. and it went to wherever they went. That's the course of so that in other words, just a little bit ago, they said if you're in Asia, you go to Ephesus, or one of those churches whose founder was Paul, that traced the course of their tradition back to the church of Ephesus, that traces its course back to, see what I'm saying? That the course of that tradition is, again, what Tertullian was arguing later was, how do you know if it's true? Well, does it come from a church of an apostle? And I would say Bousset, who was, those of you, when he was a, a French bishop in the 18th oh. century, and his idea, I think it was 18th century, uh, was, was arguing the understanding of when, when we, we have an idea of the Trinity uh, coming more vivid in the 4th century, it's because it wasn't that it so much developed as Newman's idea or as the Jesuits thought in the Enlightenment period that we became so much smarter. It's that it was always there. But it was the apost what was it called the apostolic secret. I, I think is what that's it was. What he, I think that's what Bossuet used. Yeah, that's right. That it was always there, 
but it wasn't as explicitly expressed until it had to be as a result of the battles of arguments. So, so there's two ways one could interpret the word course. Newman's way is, and actually the way that I just described was the traditional way the Catholic Church took it for most of its history. I'm, I'm quite sure. Isn't that true, Monsignor? In other words, that there, there was a deposit that was passed, ha, passed on and then yeah. carried. The development was a later... But, but I, I think Newman, I, I think to be fair to St. John Henry Newman, um, that development is, is organic. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's not something new. And Yeah, granted. The, his yeah. point was yeah. that the acorn oak analogy is that it was anything that we see pop up, if you will, in the seventh century has to be traced back to uh, mm -hmm. a corn of an idea in the, we, we could spend the next hour talking about the seven keys to understanding the seven notes, but we won't go there in terms of okay. the, the essay. But, <laughs> but, but I, I, I think that's an important point. I know, and I'm pretty sure that was a key uh, point here in your own, spiritual journey towards the Catholic Church, right, Monsignor? This, oh, yeah. this very uh -huh. sentence here. That's right. Uh, I think that's right, yeah. And, or, you know, oh, I just want to say, you know, I love the, what, he, what he follows with, this argument yes. that you don't have to be, you don't have to be intellectually proficient to be a faithful Christian. <laughs> you want to read us into that them. section? Yeah, okay. And to this rule consent many nations of the barbarians, those I mean who believe in Christ, having salvation written by the Spirit in their hearts without paper and ink, and diligently keeping the old tradition. And then he goes on there to talk about basically the easy language of the creed there. So they learn their creed. Um, and these these people that, that don't have writing or reading, they can still keep the faith. They can still be as faithful as anyone. Um, yeah, earlier on, doesn't he yeah. doesn't he refer to the creed as the what's he call it? Um, he has a term for it, not not the code, but the um, um, regular. In other words, it's yeah. for those that can't read the scriptures. That, That's right. And we, you know, we know um, in a few years now, uh, St. Hippolytus in his apostolic tradition talks about how um, the, the catechized were taught to memorize the creed. And that creed was going to be with them. It was going to be in their hearts. And through their daily lives, they could, they could, they could recollect the parts of the creed and apply them to their lives. And it was, didn't Cyril say the same thing in his catechetical instructions? Oh, yeah. Same uh -huh. thing. That's what that was about. Yeah. Those people yeah. that couldn't read, and the truth is, it didn't matter whether they could read or not, they couldn't get in their hands a copy of the Bible at that point. I mean, it was available, That's but right. not extremely expensive and rare, only in the churches, so they would have the creed. And so this is part, he goes on to say, this faith, such as have believed without letters, in our discord, indeed, are barbarians. But as to their view, their custom and behavior, because of their faith, they are extremely wise and please God, walking in all justice and chastity and wisdom. I mean, so once there, you're just you're talking about it. I mean, it, it's just so heartwarming to read this. And if anyone should tell them of the inventions of the heretics, Conversing in their language, presenting presently, they would shut their ears and think they could not fly far enough, not enduring so much as to hear the blasphemous talk. Thus, by that old tradition apostolic, they admit not even to a passing glance of the mind any of their monstrous things, for as yet there was no congregation among them, nor any doctrine 
yeah. it's just it's a beautiful account of um and uh, you know i'm not of how uh, we make we make the faith more complicated than we need sometimes and yep. i just i was very touched by that yep yeah you know i was marcus i just wanted to mention something that i've been doing the last week or so um um well, you've been toiling away out there in Ohio. I've been reading a book, and it just had blown me away. Um, it's it's called Veritas. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, just pu- was it just been published? Is that by Monsignor Veritas. Snyder? No, this is by a fellow. Um, I think he was a writer. For, he's a writer for the maybe. I know he publishes in the National Geographic magazine and stuff. His name is Ariel Sabar, S-A-B-A-R. And it's um, it's about how at my seminary at Harvard Divinity School, um, the, the, the uh, professor um, of uh, the Hollis Professor of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School, she got take, taken in by a fake papyrus that proclaimed that um, Mary Magdalene was the wife of Jesus. And this story, Veritas, you know, Harvard, that's yeah. Harvard's motto, Veritas, that the whole university basically got suckered into this thing. And it's utterly fascinating story because it's all about Gnosticism. <laughs> it's, it's about how, I don't mean to, you know, step on toes here, but it's all about how a certain kind of feminism that's prevalent in in the world today yeah um basically is gnostic to the core and and this this uh, professor was completely taken in by it um some guy down in florida sold her this fake papyrus and and she went with it <laughs> and um when it was it just blew up in everybody's face yeah. and and I just think if people want to have um, an account of what Gnosticism looks like today, um, this book Veritas is a is a really remarkable piece of work. I think so. But it's, it's, of course, I was, could, I was so. It seems to argue. In some ways, yeah. Well, this seems to argue. And, um, and and I think Monsignor will close with this paragraph yeah. today, and then we'll pick up on section sure. three next uh-huh. week. Um, the the it, I find it fascinating here when you think of Irenaeus. First of all, let's back up. I, I find it fascinating when I think about my own background, coming from a Bible alone, uh, sola scriptura background, without any question whatsoever that there was any flaw in that understanding. And, 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 and then looking around and seeing the fact that solo scriptura doesn't work anywhere because there's so many different interpretations of the scriptures. Um, there's no one doctrine that every Christian agrees on. There isn't one. You can't name one doctrine, even about Jesus. There's no one doctrine that every Christian mm-hmm. agrees on. So, so where do you go? Well, in this case, I find it fascinating that he's not just saying the apostolic tradition. He's adding the word old. I thought that was, to me, fascinating to reflect on. I don't know. I can't remember. I'm I'm anxious to go look as we dig back into this, though I've read this a couple times, if he ever used that phrase, old tradition apostolic, in the rest of the book. Or in just this reference to these barbarian people that obviously can't read, maybe they're not even Latins or Greeks, they're probably those Germans that he talks about uh, uh, that are, are going to come down and conquer Rome in a couple hundred years. But, but one of the apostles apparently, or one of the disciples of one of the apostles, went up into their area like James going into India or Mark going, of course, Mark went to Alexandria, which was pretty highfalutin, but to go into some area. Oh, Cyril and Methodius. It's like Cyril yeah. and Methodius going in and having to, to create an alphabet yeah. 
to communicate the gospel to the people. But they learned the original old tradition and they're holding on to it. They're holding on to it. And any of these other ideas that come in, they say, that ain't according to what we learned. Oh, because the, the Gnostics, all those Gnostics, we'll find as we start, pick up next week, they're all new. Their ideas are new. They don't go that far back. And, and I guess the great overarching theme here is this is evidence of the devil coming in and trying to plant weeds in the garden of the Lord. All right, Monsignor, could you, at this point then, could you close us with, with a blessing? Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Lord, we thank you for the gift of faith and how it, it reaches through all the parts of the world and can touch the hearts and the minds of all different kinds of people. And we thank you that it's all true. All of it is true. Um, and that our intellects are given to serve that and not to leave it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you, Monsignor, for joining me today. Thank you. And all of you listening, thank you very much. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, and we look forward to being with you again next week.